Dr. Kasimitz is a presidential pro uh, professor of sociology at the CUNY Graduate Center. He is currently director of the program in International Migration Studies. He chaired the CUNY doctoral program in sociology from 2001 to 2011, and then again in 2014 to 2017. Dr. Kasimitz graduated from Boston University in 1979 and earned his doctorate from NYU in 1987. He specializes in, in immigration, ethnicity, race relations, urban social life, and the nature of con contemporary cities. He's the author of numerous books, right? I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, has received countless number of awards. And since 2005, he has been the book review editor at EES for uh, uh, EES Journal the Soci Sociological Forum. He is a member of the Historical Advisory Board of the Statue of, Liberty, Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation and a former member of the Social Science Research Council's Committee on International Migration and the Russell Sage Foundation's Committee to Study Social Effects of 9-11 in New York. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank Dr. Kastnitz for sharing his wisdom with us today. I want to thank uh, Professor Kaplan, Professor Lemick, uh, and President uh, Martinez Sines for, uh, for the invitation. It's a great flattery. And I want to thank all of you for coming. And it uh, says a great deal about the interest in this topic at the moment, which we're all facing. Uh, before I get into my presentation, actually, I will take advantage of a captive audience to make two commercial interruptions. The first, and I forgot to bring my flyers. Don't trust the professor, we have anything detail oriented. Um, but the uh, CUNY Graduate Center now has, as Dr. Kaplan has mentioned, a program in a master's degree in international migration studies. So, if you are thinking of a master's degree, if you have students that are thinking of a master's degree, um, if you have students who are not quite sure what they want to do, if you're working as a professional in the field of migration, but would like to perhaps increase your educational credentials as well as your educational view of things, uh, please do check out the master's degree in international migration studies. The Statue of Liberty is uh, going to have a new museum dedicated to liberty, but also to a considerable sense of migration. Uh, this comes out of the problem that most of the visitors to the Statue of Liberty can't actually get up into the crown anymore for security reasons. Um, so one of the ways that they've tried to deal with that is take some of the land that was owned on Liberty Island and expand the museum. It was a very small museum initially. It was actually in the base of the pedestal. And since more people are going into the pedestal now, they've rearranged things. And this will, after many years, because you get a whole bunch of people around arguing about, we will have a museum to liberty, which means, and that was the silence. So they called in a bunch of professors, and then we argue for like two years about what that actually meant. And then we had the National Park Service people say, we can't possibly, you just gave us a dissertation, not a museum, we can't put that on the wall. And then the architects argue, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, after many years of working this out, we actually have a building built with an interesting idea and interesting films and a real tribute to the migrant history of America and sufficient numbers of bathrooms, and all of our priorities are straight. And this will be opening, I believe, in the second week of May. So as New Yorkers, I know you never go to Liberty Island because no New Yorker actually goes to the Statue of Liberty unless you're about a time guess. But the next time you get a chance, there's new things going on at Liberty Island. And we're all quite proud of what, what, what eventually happened. OK, uh, that having been said, I want to now go quickly into this presentation. And what I'm doing, I should tell you, this project is basically something that uh, I'm working on with longtime writing partner, Mary Waters, uh, at Harvard. And we've been trying to sort of pull together a couple of themes that we think have really changed the 
situation in American society, particularly as we deal with migration, inequality, and race, and how they come together. And I do say, in this, I find myself at a slight, well, two real disadvantages. The first disadvantage is I'm going to be talking about a lot of things which half the people in this audience know more about than I do in specifics. Okay. So I ask you to indulge my ignorance a bit, but let me pontificate a little bit by stepping back and saying, okay, what is the general larger trends that frame many of the issues that the practitioners and the students and the students who are going to be practitioners uh, in this audience are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, on an everyday basis. So let, what's the framework in which we can stick with that? Okay. And that's what we're trying to figure out. And I guess the second thing I was going to say, my other big disadvantage is Donald Trump. Um, he's been a disadvantage for a lot of reasons. Uh, but my very specific complaint against Donald Trump, which is different from most people's complaints against Donald Trump, is it's really hard to write a book about migration policy right now. Because he changes it, like every five or six minutes, you know, and, and you think you've got it down, ah, oh, this makes sense, because this, 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 this is what they're doing, and he does something so completely wacko that you wait, that doesn't, that's not consistent with what just happened, how do I then, you know, rethink, and he moves to the left, he moves to the right, he moves open and shutter, and blah, 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 and his own administration contradicts him, so for if you're trying to write a book, this is really frustrating, because as soon as you think you got a handle on it, it changes. Uh, so all of my remarks are tentative. <laughs> that having been said, the publisher wants the damn thing done. So you know, at, at, at a certain point, we're going to have to say end volume one and just send it in. Anyway, this is going up. Ah, so basically, I'd like to tell two stories okay, of what characterize a lot of the literature on both migration and race relations in the United States at the moment. Uh, the first story is really the story of undocumented migration. Uh, and for reasons I will explain in a few minutes, the question of undocumented migration as opposed to migration in general has become much more prominent in recent years. The second is the story of, well, for shorthand, I'm using the term mass incarceration here, but mass incarceration really is a shorthand for an increased law enforcement presence in people's lives. Now, the most obvious manifestation of that is mass incarceration. But it can also take place in ways that don't necessarily involve long prison sentences, but do involve a lot of interaction with the criminal justice system. And the criminal justice system, in terms of the definition of who is and who is not a full member of our society, who are the people to which we need to owe a certain obligation of care and an obligation of service in terms of their being a member, the not member, yeah. um, just as the question of who's documented and who's not hinges on that. Okay? So increasingly does the criminal justice system play a role in defining that. Okay? Um, in a weird way, we're arguing that these two issues are kind of converging in American society today in a way that most of the people who study one or the other haven't thought a lot about. It. Okay. And it says a lot about the changing nature of race in America. So, I guess like any American story, we kind of have to start with race. Um, and race at the moment seems to be a rather contradictory um, story. On the, you know, it wasn't that long ago that people were talking about a post-racial America with the election of Barack Obama. Now, I never really thought we were at the verge of post-racial America. I don't think most people have thought about these things in any depth did. But I think we did think that, well, there was now the possibility of a post-racial America. It was going to take more work. But the fact that you know Barack Obama was elected twice, something that I'm old enough to remember a time when I thought that that would never happen in my lifetime, that meant a difference. It was new. It was not something that had happened, and it was quite inconsistent with a lot of American history. Um, we seem, looking back on that at the moment, it seems slightly naive. Okay. So, what does that mean? On the other hand, many of the trends that led us to think, in addition to Barack Obama's election, that led us to think that racial relations were changing, still did happen. Since the 1960s, and again, I'm taking a long view here, 
the black middle class has grown exponentially. Um, the um, number of African Americans in positions of high political office has grown exponentially. The private sector has lagged behind the public sector in that, but increasingly the number of African Americans in influential positions at the upper level of the private sector is considerably larger than anyone in the 1950s or 60s imagined it would be. Okay. So there's been some real changes. At the same time, we've seen a massive increase in the percentage of the African American population that has been enmeshed in the criminal justice system. And a lot of folks, uh, Michelle Alexander is probably the best known, if you haven't read her book, The New Jim Crow, read her book, The New Jim Crow. Um, a lot of people have been looking at that as kind of the extension of racial oppression in a new guise, in the guise basically of criminal justice. Um, there's also, of course, all the attention to issues of racial violence and confrontation with law and authority. And I just said, put the uh, term Black Lives Matter movement up there as kind of a shorthand. But what Black Lives Matter has done is it has concentrated a lot of thinking in terms of race relations on a particular kind of situation, the confrontation between law enforcement and other authority figures in public places and African Americans. Uh, and increasingly, that's where the forefront of racial debate is. It's, it's less about discrimination in the job market, though there's obviously lots of that, but it's less about discrimination in the housing market and more about what happens you know, when two people, strangers to each other, one of whom is an armed agent of the state and one of whom is African American, confront each other you know, in a public place. And when you think of and the tragic events that have occurred with that. And that's become increasingly central. Okay. Um, so let me talk a little about mass incarceration. And you all probably know these numbers as well as I do, but I think it's kind of interesting to just, well look, you invite a sociologist here, you're gonna get a few numbers, right? I mean, in, sorry, but it has to happen. Um, but it's important to look at it in a kind of a long-term thing. So this is a graph of the US imprisonment rate from 1920 on. And as you can tell, I don't know if you can read the numbers at the bottom, but starting in 1980s, we were pretty consistent. Right? The percentage of the US population that ended up doing time from 1920 to 1970, we had half a century of it being pretty consistent. It's a little shot up towards the end of the Depression, then it goes down during World War II, then kind of shoots up a little bit, but it's really quite, you know, in the long run, quite consistent. And then starting around 1970, but particularly after 1980, it looks like an escalator. Up until around 2000 and roughly five, six, seven. Um, and this is really a very dramatic and historically unprecedented increase. Right? People talk about oppression and chain gangs and all the things that happened in the 19th century, but the numbers nowhere near came where they are today. And it's important to bear in mind. Now, it has gone down a little bit since, and in fact, what I think I got to do now, I'm realizing, is update this that now that the 2018 numbers are out. You know, just get a little 2018. If 2018 was there, you'd see it sort of level off slightly at a lower rate. And that's largely because people decided that mass incarceration, there was a strange left right coalition that decided mass incarceration was a lousy idea. Actually, left, right, and center. The left didn't like it because it was obviously oppressing, you know, lots and lots of people and because it had these racial impacts. The right didn't like it partially for libertarian reasons. They were putting lots and lots of people, denying the freedom of a lot of people, but also because it really was an expansion of big government. You know, So if you're like a Grover Norquist type and you want a government you can drown in the bathtub, the idea of creating massive prison bureaucracies is not exactly what you want to do. And then the middle got really disenchanted with mass incarceration because it's freaking expensive. You know. If you put tons of people in jail for very long periods of time, it costs a fortune and probably, you know, isn't really very effective as a crime control strategy after a point. So there was sort of a, a thing with it. The other thing, of course, in the background that's happening is that way before the mass incarceration rate goes down, the rate of crime goes down, which we've all probably noticed. And 
And so the question of why are we spending all this money, you know, it was easy at the height of the crack epidemic to say jails, 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 it's the only possible solution, at least for certain politicians. But that's a much harder sell when actual crime rates are in decline. So I wanted to look a little bit just so you think about where we stand on world standards. On this. And this is important to look at too. Um, it's not just that we're an outlier compared to ourselves historically. We're an outlier compared to the rest of the world. Right? And this is a chart here. I don't know if you can read the lo lower numbers. This is the number of people per 100,000 that are imprisoned in 2015 numbers. But the new numbers are almost exactly the same. Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, I'm not even worried about them. It's cute countries at the bottom. They're little, they're cute, they have good chocolate, you know, they're, they're just showing off. Their rates are incredibly low. And their prisons are nicer than many of our colleagues. You know, I mean, but that's not even worth it. We're not them, we're not going to be them, I understand that. Okay, but when you get up to the top, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you travel a bit. I travel a bit. Um, I've had my pocket pick on the metro in Paris. I have witnessed soccer games between rival cities in Belgium enough to know that recreational violence is not utterly unknown on the continent. You know, I have been in cities in the English Midlands when the bars close, you know. <laughs> These are Canada's pretty. I mean, th th these are not paradisically uh, uh, non-violent countries, right? It's not that there's a massive difference. There are racial conflicts in Belgium. There are racial conflicts in France. There are racial conflicts in the UK. And yet, look, I mean, we're not just a little bit of an outlier. We are an outlier by several orders of magnitude. It's just crazy. And. The question, of course, is to what extent is this race? And this is one of these great yes and no's, right? Because if you look at the little incarcerated by race, first of all, and this is one of those you can argue it either way, um, African Americans are almost three times more likely to be locked up than whites, and they're almost twice as likely, it's just over twice as likely as Hispanics to be locked up than whites. Okay. So that's real. On the other hand, Whites in the United States are still twice as likely to be locked and more than twice as likely to be imprisoned as anybody of any race in the UK, right? And close to three times as likely as in Canada. Okay. So we lock up, one, number one, this is hugely disproportionately racial in its impact, and we're far more likely to, to uh, do this for people of African descent. But by the way, we also lock up more of everybody than any other country that we're remotely comparable to in terms of level of development. Now, get a little more technical here. I probably go through this quickly, and I recognize this graph is hard to read, um, and it's not mine. It comes from I should give credit to do from a report from the National Academy of Sciences that Bruce Western uh, took. But if you can see this, this was trying to get at what are the odds that a person is going to get imprisoned over their lifetime. Okay. And the red bars are people born in the second half of the 1940s. Because, you know, lifetime, you need to go back a ways. You know, to, to, to people, you know. And the uh, black bars are people who were born in the second half of the 1970s. And among whites, as you can see, uh, first of all, the numbers, Point one, for everybody, the numbers went way up. Okay. Point two, for whites, the difference between high school dropouts, people who are high school graduates, or GED graduates even, was relatively small, you know, among people born in the 1940s. Okay. And it's quite large among people born in the 1970s. In other words, you'll notice that whites, 20% of dropouts can expect to spend some time in prison, you know, whereas 6%, or no, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong bar. Three, among whites, well, slightly under 4% of high school dropouts can expect to spend some time in high school prison, whereas only about 1.5% of people who graduated high school. So high school graduation, not even college graduation, high school graduation makes a difference. 
When we do the racial comparison, again, massive differences, you know, and those differences were true for the earlier cohort and the later cohort, but it's increasingly true for the later cohort, right? That for all African Americans, high, uh, high school dropouts have gone up to like over a quarter, can expect to send, spend some time in prison, whereas it was only a little over 10% for the older folks. But here's what's really interesting. Most of the mass incarceration seems to be concentrated in the African-American high school dropout group, where the large majority can expect to spend some time in prison, as opposed to African-Americans with even a high school degree. Again, we're not talking a college degree. A high school degree, it's you know less than a third life is life. In fact, White high school dropouts are more likely to go to prison than black high school graduates. So, you know, race matters a lot, but it looks like social class, and in this case education, also matters, and they're interacting. So we've got to think of these things as mobile. Um, and, oh, but by the way, there's just another way of looking at how this changed between 1972 and 2010, which are just convenient numbers that we happen to have a lot of data on. Um, and again, for whites, interestingly, you'll notice that for whites today, take the latter, the lighter bar to give you the latter idea, uh, white high school dropouts go to prison a lot more than Hispanic high school dropouts do. Why do you think that is? I mean, more than twice as well. Well, part of it's a data glitch. These Hispanic high school dropouts are not really high school dropouts for the most part. They're probably people who have less than high school education or immigrants. And immigrants commit many, many less crimes and get arrested much less often than do natives of any race. You know, it's almost uniformly true. And by the way, if you ever want to get some hate mail, go on the radio and say that. I have never received as much hate mail as some little casual NPR interview I did where I said, oh, of course, you know, one of the reasons crime is down is because immigrants are up and immigrants uh, commit those crimes, yeah. Which is just a totally common sense thing. Everyone in social sciences knows that. Boy, I got back to my office and, you know, my email's okay to find, but it's kind of long and complicated. I didn't expect I was going to get that many. It's just fill inbox with all kinds of people calling me everything but a child of God. Um, <laughs> But again, you'll notice, you know, uh, among, notice here we have with the college numbers. Now, African-American college numbers, way more likely to be in prison than white college numbers. That's the C at the bottom. Okay. But still dramatically less than any other group, and it hasn't changed very much. The African-American college graduates are no more likely today to be incarcerated than they were in 1972. In fact, if you actually look at the numbers, more recently, actually went down. Meanwhile, this massive prison buildup took place almost entirely among the people at the lower levels of education. Okay, so concentrated among the poor, concentrated among the less educated, um, particularly for imprisonment. Now, maybe a little different for what I would call aggressive policing. And I think one of the reasons that we're often confused about that is because it's much more likely that high school dropouts are going to spend a lot of time in prison. But imprisonment is not the same as getting picked up, spending the night in jail, getting harassed, you know. And one of the kind of political geniuses of the Black Lives Matters movement was to make that the most the central issue because that unifies African Americans of all social classes and all ethnicities. No cop asks, are you one of those upwardly mobile striving Obama type college graduates or one of those bummy drug dealers, right? He just sees a black person. He doesn't say, you know, are you one of those virtuous African immigrants or one of those, you know, but you know, it, it, it's, it flattens out all the ethnic differences and all the class differences. Okay. But imprisonment doesn't which is an interesting uh, 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 thing with that. And so that is increasingly important in an increasingly diverse African-American community. And nowhere is that more obvious than in New York. Okay. Um, is this the war on drugs? Well, Alexander and many other people push the idea that 
the mechanism by which mass incarceration became a real problem was the war on drugs. And that's about half true. In some ways, yeah, a lot of this is the war on drugs. But even if you eliminated drug arrests, and particularly nonviolent drug arrests, almost entirely, which, by the way, an awful lot of Americans now are in favor of. If you look at any of the polling data, one of the things we've really switched on is how we think about nonviolent drug offenses. Most people are now in favor of not imprisoning nonviolent drug offenses. Um, we're going to legalize marijuana in a whole bunch of states. Um, you know, whether it happens this month or next month or you know next year in New York and New Jersey is still being negotiated, but it's going to happen. Um, it's one hates to be cynical, but it is interesting that the idea that opioid addiction is a medical problem that has absolutely no business being dealt with by the criminal justice system, but it's an epidemic. How often have you heard the opioid epidemic? When white people started to use, you know, smack, suddenly it was a medical problem. You know, it had been a criminal problem for a really long time. This was, you know, we have this interesting change that opioid addiction was almost all seen as a minority, as a black and Latino problem until relatively recently. Now it's seen largely as a white problem, you know, because of changing drug use patterns. Okay, and suddenly now it's medical. Yes. Um, now I should just mention that prison is kind of the tip of the iceberg, and I. Uh, don't want to go through all of the, uh, the the other people have written about this, but if you actually look at the number of people in prison, you know, look how much that went up. But look how many people spend a lot of time in jail. Look at how many people are on parole at any given time. And the big increase is the number of people on probation. So whenever you see numbers about imprisonment, remember that's just like you know when you throw the rock in the, in, in the pond and the ripples come out, you know. I mean, prison is the rock, but you've got this big ripple of people whose lives are in some ways uh, um, uh, under surveillance, under control by the state at the moment. And it has real consequences in the long term. And I think these are consequences for democracy, particularly because they are so racially and ethnically divided. Uh, you're talking about the one group of people in society who can be legally and openly discriminated against. Ex-felons, you are perfectly entitled to say, I don't want to hire an ex-felon, or I don't want to rent to an ex-felon, right? Um, you, they, you can't serve on a jury. You're ineligible for most security clearances in the federal government. You can't enlist in the military. Uh, you're prohibited from adopting in many, many uh, jurisdictions. Uh, you can be excluded from many federal public housing programs. In other words, we've created virtual non-citizens. They've become, for all intents and purposes, like undocumented immigrants. Now, what's strange about this is, of course, that we are going back and forth. And Florida just kind of put almost a million people back on the voter roll. Now, whether that's really going to work out or not is still in the courts, and the devil is very much in the details. But there's been a lot of going back and forth on this. Um, also, the consequences vary a huge amount by state, right? In South Carolina, as I put on, which is probably the most uh, draconian of all, you've got a jury ban for life, you've got uh, voting bans, you've got a full ban on whether you're qualified for SNAP or TANF, uh, you're ineligible for all public housing, you're ineligible to carry a firearm, which is a big deal in South Carolina. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm against that. You know, you get the idea. Uh, you're ineligible for all forms of public office. Okay, in Maine, you can actually vote while you're in prison. Yeah. Right. And it's probably not completely coincidental that the nicest states to their former incarcerated people are Maine and Vermont. You know, which are two of the whitest states in the union. Uh, and the toughest states are South Carolina and Mississippi. Um, and there's the loss of voting rights, okay, um, including you know lifetime bans in Mississippi, Arizona, and Nevada. By the way, the states that don't have huge black populations in that are the states that have huge Hispanic populations. Um, and of course, this means that if these groups are residentially concentrated as they are, and if they live in the same places where there's a lot of undocumented immigrants as they do, what do you get? you get electoral districts in which 
lots of people can't participate in the polity, which of course increases the power of those people who can participate in the polity. Right? You're eliminating certain groups, and you're getting a polity that doesn't look like the population, which is something that you know people in electoral history and electoral theory and political science have been trying to eliminate for the last 200 years. Right? It's virtual rotten birds. It's back to a very old problem in the way in which uh, democratic politics is supposed to work. Now, let me turn quickly to, well, uh, let me just skip over that, and let's talk about immigrants, and why I think the immigration story is intersecting with the story. Um, first, just this is again stuff you all, this audience probably all know, but just so we're all on the same page, who are our immigrants in the United States? There's about 43 million immigrants, they're about 13% of the population, their kids are about another 12% of the population, so we're talking about, if you talk about immigrants and their minor children, a quarter of the American population. Obviously highly concentrated in places like New York, it's much higher. Um, they are, for the most part, at least if you look at the children of immigrants, legal, the children of legal immigrants in the United States are doing pretty well. And I do not have time to support that statement with anything like data, only to say that I wrote a really long and fairly boring book on the subject. <laughs> so if you're interested, uh, you know, this is about New Yorkers and what they do and what we found in a very long, very expensive study was that the children of immigrants in metropolitan New York are largely English dominant by the third generation. They're forgetting their parents' language, which is a problem, but not the problem people usually think of. Um, they have better education than either immigrants or native minority groups, uh, native racial minorities. They have very high labor force participation. Their earnings are higher than uh, African American and um, Hispanics of native parents, though they're slightly lower than those of native whites. But when you consider that this is in one generation, that's you know not a big surprise. That was also true of, of uh, European immigrants, you know, half a century ago in the first generation. It takes longer than one generation to catch up. Okay, um, and we're available from better bookstores anywhere at the Harvard University Press. Now, so the overall story. Now, what's interesting about this is that we have actually done a better job than most of the European countries in integrating immigrants, despite the fact that we don't have an integration policy. Um, legal immigrants in the United States are kind of told to go play in the traffic. I mean, we don't really have a ministry of absorption or incorporation the way that many of the European and Middle Eastern countries do. Right? But we basically do get people, partially because our welfare state is so weak, um, people do get into the economy very fast. You know? And we expect immigrants to work. Whereas a lot of the European countries where there's more generous welfare states, but more concern about unemployment, you know, kind of expect immigrants not to work for a while, you know, as refugees, which on the one hand makes it easier for them just to you put food on the table, but on the other hand also means that they're not really integrating into the economic life of the society nearly as fast. Um, however, there's a big exception here, and that became really apparent about 10 years ago when we started to look at undocumented people and the children of undocumented people. And I should note for the record, this is a bipartisan program, problem rather. It, got, it, it was true under the Bush administration, it was true under the Obama administration, and it's gotten worse under the Trump administration, but basically, you know, the anti-immigrant, you know, this policy of deliberate non-incorporation for the children of immigrants is been something that both parties can take some of the blame for, okay? Um, now, we've had this big growth in the undocumented population really in the 1990s, up until about 2008, okay? And what's really interesting about this is a parallel, I don't know if it's causal, but if you think about it, we started locking a lot more people up despite the fact that crime was going down, and in the same period, we started to have a lot more undocumented immigrants despite the fact that many less undocumented immigrants were coming, okay? Actual and this is, again, one of those things where the news keeps messing you up. If you look at the headlines today, you would see that we're having this massive crisis on the southern border. Right? There's 16,000 know, people came through the El Paso 
court were arrested in the El Paso jurisdiction last year. 50,000 have been arrested so far this year. ICE doesn't know where to put them. You know, the city of El Paso doesn't know where to put them. Yeah. They're stuck with people coming over uh, who are asylum seekers coming in. It's important to step back. The actual number of undocumented people coming into the United States is really quite low right now. It went up a little bit this year, and it's almost entirely Central American refugees, you know, or people who are uh, requesting asylum at the border, which, by the way, is legal. You know, under a lot of really good laws, you know, you do have the right to enter a country and say, I would like to request asylum. That country has the right to deny it. Okay. But you do have the right to make a request. We passed that law after World War II because we seriously screwed up before World War II. And there's good reasons why we have that law. You know? So I mean, this, this notion of them as the illegals, you know, they were illegal because they stepped over the line to say, can I file my request for asylum? You know, they were illegal for about 10 seconds in a lot of cases. You know? So that's, I think, important to remember. Um, but the real reason that we have, well, there's interesting. Why the number of other undocumented immigrants is going down, other than the asylees? I mean, if, if basically, if there wasn't the crisis of people needing asylum from Central America, the anti-immigrant lobby would have to invent because they're it. That's the only people coming across the southern border at the moment. Net migration from Mexico is now zero. There's many people leaving this country. Okay, why is that? Partially, it's increased enforcement. Partially, it's economic development in Mexico, which, despite all of its problems, has got a very high economic growth rate and is absorbing more of its labor force than it ever used to. But the big reason is about 20 years ago, the Mexican birth rate fell very rapidly, which happens in almost every rapidly developing country. Right? So, there are many, the Mexican birth rate now is approximately the same as the American, you know, whereas it was about three times that number in the early 1980s. Now, demography takes a little while to work its way through the system. You know, just because you're having less babies doesn't mean you're producing less workers immediately. It takes 16, 18, 20 years for that to work out. But at this point, the Mexican birth rate is low enough that it's really unlikely we'll ever have massive migration from Mexico again. Now, sociologists should never say never. We're crappy at predicting the future. If Mexico totally collapsed and turned into Syria, yeah, there'd be an awful lot of Mexicans coming to the United States. But under normal labor migration conditions, that's never going to happen again. Because there's never been a country in the history of the world after that kind of reduction in the birth rate that saw it go back up. Um, the other thing about increased border enforcement, why hasn't, you know, the question really is, why hasn't the number of undocumented immigrants therefore plummeted? Well, it hasn't. It went way up, and then it stabilized. Paradox of increased border enforcement is not that more people are coming, it's that fewer people are leaving. The Southwest, for many years, had a very well-established pattern of circular migration. People came, they worked illegally, you know, they made money, they sent it home, they went back. Usually men, usually with families and children, you know, in Mexico. And to some extent, this happened with Ecuador and other places in South America. But Mexico is the, the, the big, the big thing. As migration became harder more controlled and therefore more expensive and more dangerous because it wasn't going on in El Paso and San Diego anymore, it was going on in the desert in Arizona. And more under the control of organized crime, okay? It became the kind of thing you didn't want to do very often. And people stopped going back and forth. And people started settling permanently. Which is, by the way, why building a wall is a really incredibly stupid idea. Because the problem isn't with keeping people out anymore, it's with keeping people in, which is what we're now doing. We've broken that you know, hundred year pattern, particularly in agricultural uh, um, a migra of, of back and forth labor migration, circular labor migration. So who are these 11 million undocumented people? Um, 
there are fewer ways to adjust your status than ever before. I don't know if, you, if New Yorkers are all familiar with this. We probably know lots of people who came on a legal visa to New York, became illegal because they started working or because their visa expired, and then over the next five, six years, with the help of a lawyer, they ended up getting legalized. Get your papers there. How many people do we know who did that? You know, and particularly once they had kids here. There used to be many more ways to do that. Systematically, over the last 20 years, those loopholes have been eliminated. Okay. So it's much harder to do that. The undocumented are more likely than ever to be in mixed status families. That is to say, you'll have a family. It's not just the undocumented people live over there, they're foreign, they're not us, versus the citizens live over here. In the same family, you've got US citizens, legal permanent residents, people on H-1 visas, uh, people on student visas, and people who are undocumented. Okay. Uh, which, of course, makes the whole social work environment that much more complicated, because everyone has a different legal status. Um, we've got people who were essentially raised here since they were tiny children, but were born in a foreign country and therefore had that, who were the so-called dreamers, you know, the, 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 the folks who's, you know, uh, basically Americans in all respects, except for their citizenship, and would have a heck of a bad time if they were in fact deported. Okay. Um, we've got, and the US citizen children of these folks, who are our fellow citizens, but deeply hurt by their family's undocumented status. You know, they, their education levels are lower than people who are actually, you know, uh, where, where parents were able to get documented. They're, um, there's all sorts of different health outcomes that are worse. And a lot of this just has to do with having parents who didn't want to interact with the public system. Didn't want to go to the health system. Didn't want to go to the hospital very often. Didn't ever show up for a parent-teacher conference. You know, you do that for a whole bunch of parents and citizens, you're going to hurt their citizen children. Okay? And most interesting, this is the biggest change. The undocumented population in the United States used to be a transient population. And the reason they weren't a big political issue in the 1960s and 70s is because they were people who were going back and forth. And people who were interested in the politics and the racial divisions of this country didn't think much about them. Okay. Today, two-thirds have been here more than 10 years. Okay. And the number who's been here less than five years has dropped to under 14%. This, these are not transient folks. These are people who are part of American communities. Okay. Um, they're also very easy to racialize because they're overwhelmingly Latino, although that's changing quite rapidly, particularly in New York, where there's a large Afro-Caribbean contingent, there's an African contingent, and there's a very fast-growing Asian contingent in the undocumented population. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's at least 5.2 million children of undocumented parents, most of whom are U.S. citizens. Um, what else? So I'm sort of rushing through here, but this is the kind of effects that you end up with. Um, we have criminalized this population, getting back to my criminal justice issue. Increasingly, we're treating them as criminals. Did not used to be so. Before 1990, we deported, in 1990, we deported 30,000 people, almost all coming out of long prison camps, right? In 2012, Barack Obama managed to support 419,000. Interestingly, the Trump administration actually deports less, but they arrest more. And that's because they're holding people down there. It's partially because the paperwork is not being done com very confidently. And there may be reasons for that. The result is what a number of people have called crimmigration. We have just criminalized the experience of my uh, immigration, which for a long time was not considered a criminal offense in the United States. It was a civil offense. Okay. Um, and it's a weird kind of criminalization because if you're undocumented, you can't use normal civil rights protections. You have no right to an attorney. You have no right to Miranda warnings. You can be held without bond. Um, you, um, um, you have very few constitutional protections. Even little children, unaccompanied children, are not entitled to a lawyer. <coughs> So it's a much worse than the situation of you know, normal criminal defendants, you know, for people who haven't actually committed any crimes other than crossing the border. 
Um, and there's going to be some very definite long-term consequences. Childhood stress is up, as many of you know. Um, uh, we're damaging children and grandchildren of undocumented parents through these campaigns of terror. Um, Roberto Gonzalez has a wonderful term for this in his book, um, where he describes this as waking up to a nightmare. And the nightmare he describes is how adolescents, who had never really thought about their legal status, may have not been unaware of it, suddenly sometime in high school figure out that they have limited college choices, or they can't get a driver's license or they can't get a job, you know, having have spent their whole lives here. And it's only really at that point, because the public school system actually is the one place where this doesn't matter a whole lot. So you can go, you know, basically you can go K-12 without really thinking much about your legal status, and then suddenly, boom, you're in that situation where the thing's available to you, or in fact to your brother, who was born two years later, but born in the United States, just avails himself of okay. um, Anyway, I, that's a wonky digression, which in the interest of time, I'll pass over. Um, it's interesting that conservatives, historically, used to be mostly worried about legal immigration. Opposition from the 19th century on, and certainly in the mid-20th century, the people who wanted fewer immigrants tended to be worried about legal immigrants. And ironically, on the few times illegal immigrants became really important in the mid-20th century, it was usually coming from the left. It was people like unions who, were, who were, didn't like the idea of illegal immigrants. They wanted more legal immigrants. Whereas conservatives really didn't want naturalization. They didn't want more citizens. They only care about workers. Yeah. Um, the Swiss um, uh, uh, playwright and journalist, uh, Max Frisch, beautifully summarized this situation way back in 1950, because his country faced it very early, where he said, the problem is we called for labor, they sent us people. You know, you know. Conservatives would like to have labor, but not people. You know, uh, and, and, and that's the problem, right? Is that, that, that pe people have people needs. You know, people need social services. People need political participation. People have cultural needs. People are parts of communities. You know, you can't get the labor without the people. Okay. Well, increasingly, this is what our situation, our legal status is starting to do. Um, so we've had this focus on illegals. Okay. Um, increasingly, we're trying to square that circle by saying, we like immigrants, we don't like illegal immigrants, without noticing that there are very few ways for a lot of people to emigrate legally. Okay. Um, and we criminalized immigrants. And I, with Tom, in the interest of time, I won't show this YouTube clip, but it's a dramatic clip that the Republicans uh, were running in the last uh, midterm election about the horrors and brutality of illegal immigrants as murderers, even though we all know that the crime rates among illegal immigrants are incredibly low. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of collateral damage. This is where the Trump administration is different from the Obama administration. The Obama administration actually deported many more people, but the Trump administration is doing it in communities and workplaces as opposed to coming out of prisons. And as a result, when they pick up other people who also, they're arresting them too. So we're actually having more people arrested, even if less people are deported. And this takes me back to the mass incarceration thing because what the thing that's happened has been, as crime has declined, many parts of this country have a decline in prison population. They've got big prisons that they built up in the 70s and 80s that they're now would be empty, except for the fact that we're detaining a lot more immigrants. You know, and the federal government is increasingly subletting, because about half of the entire federal imprisonment, uh, the entire federal prison system is now people awaiting deportation. They're actually having arrangements with local jails, with state prison systems that are under capacity, and increasingly with private prisons, okay, who have a definite interest in keeping this going. So, what do we do about this? I'm a, I'm a lowly scholar, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping some of you have some answers. I will say that. It's important to note that we have the tendency on the part of critics is to speak a very racial language and to try to focus on people's rights. 
And that's good as far as it goes, because, you know, obviously there is a racial element to this. But the problem with the civil rights 20th century point of view for this 21st century problem is very hard to defend the civil rights of people who, by definition, don't have civil rights, which is undocumented anyway. So I think we'd somehow have to turn the conversation more to something about human rights. Right? There are people who merit certain considerations by being fellow human beings. And trying to do that within the civil rights frame has thus far not been particularly effective. Um, we need clear thinking about the ways that our laws are inconsistent with our values. And I was interested in President Martinez Sayas talking about the Franciscan mission. You know, that the values that we think of as most important to what makes us this country are being very ill-served by the current policy. And I think with that, we need to start thinking more creatively, and I hope you all can do some of this, about how you address 21st century problems without always reverting to the 20th century solutions. You know, and I think that that's been, and even the best of the Green Room movement, when you think about it, immediately as a civil rights metaphor. And that's good, because that's a powerful metaphor. I mean, we under the Martin Luther King tradition and the way of marching and everything like that. But so far, that hasn't worked real well. So what I'm struggling with now is how do we take the best of that tradition, but also think of it in terms of a new problem that is increasingly working its way through issues of citizenship and criminal justice. Thank you very much.